worship at Trinity Presbyterian Church in this Advent season. We are delighted that you are joining us for worship today. If you are newer to our congregation, welcome. We hope this time of worship is a great blessing to you. Please take note of all the important announcements found in your bulletin. Please also make sure you read the weekly update. It gets emailed every Wednesday, and we also have printed copies available at the back of the church for those of you who do not receive email. Don't miss next week's um, Christmas pageant. I'm looking forward to it as the children lead us in worship. At this time, we'd like to invite Eric Carlson forward for a minute for ministry. I'm up here as much as Catherine lately, so <laughs> maybe I can get on the payroll. So, uh, just uh, want to take a few minutes this morning to give everyone an update uh, as where we are on uh, security and safety for the church, and it's going to be exciting. But we're going to actually set off some alarms and sirens for you to hear <sighs> here in a few moments. Uh, Desta is going to help out here from uh, from the back of the church, but just to give you a quick update, we currently have. Uh, eight working smoke alarms in the church. Uh, there is one more to be installed in the sharing place, uh, so then that'll complete the smoke detector uh, uh, project. Uh, we have a couple more little things that we need to finish. One, uh, we've had some issues with the front door closing tightly, uh, so we're gonna do a little bit of work on the weather strip there, so that'll finish that, then it'll latch uh, properly. And uh, at some point in January, uh, we're going to be rekeying all of the door locks within the church. So if you're someone who needs a key to, uh, to get into church at some point, uh, please see Jen and she can get you a key card or a key fob and uh, then you'll have access uh, after that. But we'll keep you posted when it's going to happen so you don't come in one day and can't get into the church. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll be taking care of that. So uh, I'm actually looking for Desta and I don't see him so there he is. Okay. You changed seats on me. So, uh, yes, Desta, if you could jump up, we're going to uh, do a quick demonstration. So what we're going to test first is the smoke alarm system. So at the back of the church near where the ushers are, we have installed, uh, and also in Tate Hall downstairs, there is now a, pu a pull alarm for smoke detectors should we have a smoke uh, issue anywhere in the church. And uh, so they can manually be set off here in the sanctuary as well as downstairs in Tate Hall. And uh, they will also go off if they detect smoke. So Catherine's going to give the congregation a heads up on Christmas Eve because we're not sure how the smoke from the candles may or may not affect things. So, so uh, it could be an exciting, even more exciting Christmas Eve than usual. So, uh, but uh, should it go off, we'll obviously tell you if it's real or not. So, but. Uh, the smoke detectors, when Desta sets this off, if you notice up here above Catherine, by the speaker, there's a red light and a blue light, okay? If you see that red light flashing, you're gonna be hearing the smoke alarms, which is just like a regular smoke alarm. It's a beep, 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 and they kind of go in echoing through the building because they're, they're at different stages. So uh, that would mean that we would follow our evacuation plan that we went over uh, the other day, and by the way, those signs will be posted by the end of this week in various locations around the church, so you'll know what exit to go out of depending on where you are should we have uh, an, an evacuation emergency. So Desta, if you could set that off, we've already given everybody heads up that uh, we're doing a test. Okay. Okay, so that same sound is going to be in eight other places throughout the church. And if we're here in the sanctuary and you hear that and see the light, then that means move to the outside aisles and proceed to exit the way we practiced a uh, uh, few Sundays ago. Okay? So that's, that's one thing to alert you of. Secondly, the blue light. That is our lockdown alarm. Okay? And so should we ever have to shelter in place, we have an emergency where we need to stay in one area of the church to be safe. Uh, if there's anyone here with intent to do harm or whatever it may be, uh, we can actually lock down now the sanctuary, which Mark is going to demonstrate how quickly and easily we can lock down the doors. 
There's a spring lock at the top of the doors now, on the double doors. And it takes literally that long to lock us in. They're on the doors in the back as well. So those same locks are now in all the classrooms. They're down in Tate Hall and they are in the sharing place. So if we're ever anywhere in a building and we have to stay in one location to keep safe, we can now do that in just a matter of seconds to, uh, to be safe. That would come in conjunction with the blue light going off and the siren that you're gonna hear now. Okay, and that echoes more throughout the outside of the building, but in here, uh, the blue light flashing tells us to do just what he did. Ushers lock down the doors, and we lock down the doors here, and we stay in place here in the, in the sanctuary. And uh, the teachers are all going to be taught the same thing. I'm going to go work with them after uh, uh, children's worship today. And uh, I think that's all. So that's where we are. The project is just about complete at this point. We may continue to tweak some things as we go, but that's where we are as of today. And uh, it's been a, been a long road, but uh, many people have helped. So thank you to, to all. And uh, as a result, we're a bit, uh, a bit safer today should we need to be. So thank you for your time. Thank you to Eric and, the, and Desta, the property ministry, and everybody who have been working so hard this fall um, to make us a welcoming but also a safe congregation. We appreciate your ministry among us. One quick note, if you like to follow along in your bulletin, we have moved a few things around today. We've made some last minute changes. The children's message will happen right after the Gloria Pottery. So I'll invite the children to come up at that time. That way they have more time to practice for their pageant next week. And then we will move the anthem to directly after the pastoral prayer and do the offertory afterwards. So sorry about all the last minute changes, but we will make it through. At this time, while the choir sings, we invite the Watson and the Ryber family forward to light the Advent wreath. <laughs> Please join with us in the call to worship. God's faithfulness shown to us. May our lives reflect your ways, O oh Lord. During Advent, we remember God's humility set before us. May our lives reflect your ways, O oh Lord. During Advent, we remember God's commands spoken to us. May our lives reflect your ways, O oh Lord. During Advent, we remember God's incredible love shared with us. May our lives reflect your ways, O oh Lord. Today, we lit two candles. The first candle reminds us that Advent is a time to hear again the message of hope offered through Jesus Christ. In a season where our lives abound with activity, Advent is a time to listen with faithful expectation. The second candle today invited us to obey God's call. As we promise, as we continue our Advent journey, let us hear what God has spoken and believe what God has promised. Please join us in God is Near.
Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you that your word never changes and your promises never fail. In faith, we know that everything we have spoken about will come to pass. Yet like your people of old, we often struggle during times of waiting. As we cast our faith in your unfailing promises, enable us to also trust the timing of your response. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. may be seated. Please join with me in the prayer of confession printed in your bulletin. Lord, you call us to be a people of hope, but we are often not hopeful. Sometimes reality is brutally hard. We forget your many blessings and focus on the prayers that were answered. We try to hope in your promises, but we get discouraged when the world pokes holes in our faith. How did Mary and Joseph do it? What kept the wise men following that star? Forgive us, Lord, when despair gets the best of us. Forgive us when we underestimate your steadfast love for us and our family. The Bible says that if anyone lives in Christ Jesus, they are a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. So hear the good news of the gospel and rejoice. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
you may be seated. At this time, Evelyn is going to share our first scripture reading, and then we will invite the children forward for the children's message. One night, Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brother, brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field tr tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly, my d bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around mine and bowed before mine. His brothers responded, so you think you'll be our king, do you? Do you actually think we will, you will reign over us? And they hate him, hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in descendants as he approached they made plans to kill him here comes the dreamer they said come on let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns we can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him and then we'll see what what becomes of his dreams thank you evelyn at this time we invite the children forward for the children's message Perfect. Hey, can I slide down? <laughs> Sorry. Here, Michaela, can you? Perfect. There is a, I brought a Christmas tree in, huh? Perfect. Thanks for making me space. I'm uh, getting this Christmas tree ready here. Got my lights. I was doing a little wrapping here before the service of lights. So I'm going to finish putting the lights around the tree here. It's way easier when your tree is small enough to pick up like this than when you have to do it at home, right? So I'm going to put my lights on here. All righty. Got the star looking good. Ta-da! Christmas tree is ready for Christmas. How does it look? Uh, it's not colorful. It's not colorful? Lights What's wrong? The lights are not on. It's not ready. Okay. So now if we find the plug. Okay. I'm going to put it right here beside Evan. Evan, can you kind of hold it for me? Okay. Good, good, good. Okay, let's plug it in. Let's see this here. Okay. Ta-da! How does it look now? Does it look ready for Christmas? Yes. yes! This is good for now. We'll put ornaments on later. Okay, so I'm going to see if I can just prop this up here somewhere. Okay, perfect. Good, good. So you were right. That tree wasn't ready for Christmas yet because it wasn't lit up. Its lights weren't shining. And right now, in the month of December, this season we call Advent. Can you say Advent? Advent. We are learning about the ornaments on our Christmon tree over there. C-H-R-I-S for Christ, M-O-N for monogram, pictures about Christ. So can you say Christmon? Christmon. There you go. So I took these off the tree this morning when we were practicing so I could show them to you. So let's look at this one first. Yell out. What is this guy right here? Candle. candle. There's actually a bunch of candle ornaments on this tree. So when you sit back down um, or the next time you're in the sanctuary, look for one of these candles. There's a lot of them. So the candle. Why do you think we have a candle on our tree? I'm going to see if anyone, there's probably a bunch of good answers for this one. Why do we have a candle? What do you think, Alyssa? Yes, the candle honors God because it's on the tree. That's, that's a good, good one. It, absolutely, the candle honors God. What else, Evelyn? Jesus lights the way. Jesus lights the way. That's a good answer. I'm loving these are all good answers. Zach, why do you think there's a candle? Um, whenever something's hard, we never give up. We never, that's right. We have the light of Jesus in us, and so we don't give up. And so you're right. Jesus lights our way. Jesus lights up our life and keeps us from giving up on things. The Christmas story reminds us of Jesus' light. And so that's why, I'm going to shut this mic off. 
That is why we have this light, that Jesus is the light of the world. Now, how does that go with my Christmas tree? Well, Jesus lights up our lives, but Jesus shines through us. So this is a question for the older kids. Help me out, older kids. So first of all, everybody, raise your hand if you've ever seen the moon in the sky. Have you ever seen the moon in the sky? Raise your hand. Awesome. Okay, older kids, does the moon actually create light? Yes or no? no? No. Why does the moon shine? Somebody tell me. What do you think? What do you think, Michaela? The sunlight reflects off of it. That's right. The moon doesn't create its own light. It reflects its light. Well, we're called to reflect Jesus' light. And you guys do that really well when you are up here singing. And when you're going to do that pageant next week, we cannot wait to see you reflect Jesus' light. And so this is up there because Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus lights our path. But we also are to be people who reflect Jesus' light. Now, I have one more ornament to show you quickly because it's kind of like a candle, but it's not. What is this? Yell out if you know what this is. Yell it out. It's a lamp. It's a genie bottle. Right. It's a genie lamp. Correct. I think this was here. Okay. Yep. Correct. So there's a whole Bible story that says, keep your lamps ready. It says, get ready to be the light of Christ whenever Jesus comes or to be the light of Christ in someone's life. And so you're right. This is like the genie lamp. But it tells us to get ready to shine Christ's light in the world. Good listening, guys. Let's pray. Jesus, you are the light of our life and the light of the world. We thank you for this Christmas tree. And when we look at it in worship, how it teaches us about being people of light. We thank you for the ways these children reflect Jesus' light through their heart and into our hearts in worship. We ask a blessing on them and their pageant next week. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you. Please join with me in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, light of the world, you have called us to be an Easter people, to live and reflect your resurrection light. But today, Lord, many of us find ourselves shrouded in the darkness of the earthly world lost in the darkness of lives that are not easy. For some of us, cares and concerns weigh heavy on our hearts today. Come to us, Lord, lighten our burdens, and send us your peace. Today, O God, we lift to you the lonely and the sick and those who are missing someone they love this holiday season. Lord, we pray for those who are fighting an illness, those moving through a season of grief. We pray for those who are recovering from surgery and those who are waiting for a test result. Lord, we pray for Kimberly's father, David Chase, as his medical team works to find good options for him and his family. We ask a blessing on him today. Lord, we pray for all of those who had a doctor's visit or were in the hospital this week. We pray for those who will get surgery this week. And we pray for all of those awaiting some good news. Lord, we thank you for our military and their families, and we pray for their safety. We thank you for all of those who serve our country in other ways. We thank you for firefighters and rescue workers, police officers, mail carriers, politicians, teachers and healthcare workers, Lord. We thank you for those who work in prisons. We thank you for all who help others. May, those, may they be people who
who do justice, seek mercy, and continue to walk humbly with you. Lord, we pray that we might be an Advent people, a people who know the light, see its grace, and await the full brightness coming in time. May we be an Advent people visited by the word and gifted by the word to be people of hope and peace and joy and light. May we be an Advent people sent not to curse the darkness, but to reject it with the power of the Spirit's fullness. May we be an Advent people filled with strength and courage to last the day and into the night. May we be an Advent people meant to walk and work together for the repairing of your creation. May we be an Advent people instructed with clarity to speak the truth of God's openness and grace. Thank you, Lord, that we are your Advent people and we do not walk this life alone. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now the worship band will lead us in an anthem. The angel came and said its name, but she could not keep from trembling. The spirit went where it went, though it could not seed forgiveness. And when it came to pass again, enterprising in its legend, the government did all it could to be sure its power was given. To see yourself, what have you done with yourself? Have you missed it? To be of life in living it, love in fullness, life worth living. To understand. The Son of Man for the vision is the only In Israel, the sacrifice indignation is the mending. Blessed is the woman, woman, for to
great music in this church. Thank you, worship band. So this week, our session found out about um, a woman in our community who has three children, one with a terminal illness. Um, she has paid her rent, and she's doing her best to make ends meet, but we found out her heat was off. And so thanks to your generosity, we're able to put money from our budget into a line that's called the Pastor's Discretionary Fund. And that allowed me to write a check very quickly to get her heat turned back on while she is busy caring for a child in um, the Akron Hospital and juggling her other children at home. So thanks to your generosity, we can respond quickly to emergencies in our community. So thanks for your giving. We will. 
come, Lord Jesus, come to a community with people who are hurting, to a world where people are hurting, to a church congregation trying our best to let your light shine through each of us. Bless these gifts that they might be used for your kingdom here in our communities and around the world. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture passage today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 to 24. Listen for the word of the Lord. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But, that's, but just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit." She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgins shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask for eyes to see and ears to hear. Your will and your way for us this day. It's in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that we pray. Amen. So I have this reoccurring dream at night. I have two of them, actually. In one, I'm in a classroom staring at a math test full of matrices and equations, and I am totally panicked 
because I have absolutely no idea what any of the correct answers are. I am pretty sure that congregational mathematician Marlene Eshva never has a nightmare like this. <laughs> the second reoccurring dream I have is that I am in a school hallway and I'm staring at a Grove City College class schedule and it is the end of the semester and I have just realized that there was a class I was supposed to be going to that I haven't attended the whole semester. Like water aerobics or 20th century American history, I had no idea I was supposed to be there. And so now I know I'm gonna fail because I didn't show up for the whole semester and my little Grover life is ruined. <laughs> These are not the dreams I had in high school or college. These are the reoccurring nightmares of my adult life. <laughs> And I don't often dream, or at least I don't often remember my dreams, but when I do, it's always academic Armageddon. <laughs> Last night, I dreamed that my art project was due, and I forgot to turn it into my art teacher. So thank you, Cindy Rosser, for the wonderful painting wor workshop I was at yesterday. I had a great time, but apparently in my dreams, I'm just seriously deranged. <laughs> there are dreamers throughout the Bible. Both the Old and New Testaments are filled with dreamers and their dreams and their daydreams and their night visions. And you could really make an argument that the story of salvation is thread together through the dreamers and their dreams. Look at the prophets in the Old Testament. That's an easy one. Those people were all about daydreams and holy visions and night dreams from God. And in the prophets' visions, like the book of Daniel would be full of them, we learn things. When someone in the Old Testament has a dream or a vision, we learn about the character of God. We learn about God's presence with us. We learn about God's purposes in our lives, and we learn about the plans God has for us and our families. And that's what happens when Isaiah or Ezekiel would receive a dream or a vision. But it's not just the prophets in the Bible that were dreamers. If you go way back to the very beginning of our Bibles in Genesis, there are no less than 10 major dreams in the book of Genesis where God shows up. And so today, Evelyn read to us about Joseph. Not the Joseph we know at the manger scene, but Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat guy. Joseph, I love this part in his story, is mocked by his brothers. They bully him. They say, dreamer, dreamer, because they get tired of him talking about all of the dreams that God has given him. And yet... Joseph will find a piece of his salvation in his dreams and his ability to interpret his dreams and the dreams of others. Salvation finds Joseph in the midst of his dreaming. Joseph's story is in Genesis, but Jacob's story is also in Genesis. And Jacob is another big biblical dreamer. Jacob has a dream as he is on the run. He is in trouble. He is in the wilderness, both spiritually and physically. Jacob has just stolen the birthright from Esau. He's on the run. He's afraid he's going to be killed by his brother. And so in the midst of the wilderness of Bethel, Jacob falls asleep. And he rests his head on a rock and he dreams. And when he dreams, he sees heaven and the angels and the ladder and the angels are moving down and the angels are moving up. Heaven is communing with him. And then, which is a part of Jacob's dream that people often forget, in that dream, the Lord actually shows up and stands beside Jacob. And again, in this dream, Jacob receives messages about God's presence with him. God's purpose for his life and his family's life. God's plans for his family. And then in return, in the midst of that dream, those of us who are reading also learn about the character of our God. 
And so in the book of Genesis, the very beginning of the story of salvation, we see all of these dreamers and their dreams, and it continues through the entire salvation story. And so it should be no surprise that when we open to read about the birth of Jesus and we look at the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew was a good Jewish guy writing to a good Jewish audience about the good Jewish Messiah that had just come to be among them. It's not surprising that Matthew is going to start with a dream. The first few verses of Matthew are a genealogy, but as soon as he begins to tell his story of God come among us, he starts the story with a dream. We enter the story through Joseph's dream. The story of salvation is tied into all of the dreams and the dreamers in our Bibles. If you want to get super nerdy about this, then you should know that Matthew is going to hide the word Genesis in the Greek in his first chapter of his gospel in two different places. And so if you were reading the Bible in the original Greek, the word Genesis or the Greek word for Genesis would appear in chapter 1, verse 1, and chapter 1, verse 18. It's hidden in our English translations because we translate it as in the beginning, or this is the origin story for Jesus Christ, or this is how it all started when Jesus came to be among us. But he uses the same word. Beginnings in people's lives and beginnings in our lives and beginnings in the salvation story happen when people have daydreams and night visions and they are visited by God. Joseph, in our story today, he is engaged, right? But he's got a problem because his fiancée is pregnant and he is clueless about how that happened. So now he decides he's going to divorce her. And he's going to do it quietly because Joseph was a nice guy like that. But we are told in Matthew he has resolved. It's final. He's definitely going to do it. He has resolved to divorce her. And then Joseph dreams. And what happens? An angel of the Lord appears in the dream, and the angel says, as angels often say, do not be afraid. But this time the angel says, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. The child is actually from the Holy Spirit. You're going to have a son. Name him Jesus. He will save the people from their sins. Joseph has a dream. It's the story of how God came to be with us in Jesus Christ, but it all starts with Joseph, the New Testament dreamer. The stories of Christmas, the stories of Zechariah and Elizabeth, Mary and Joseph, wise men, shepherds, they're all bursting with dreams, daydreams and night visions from God. And so I wonder, when is the last time anyone ever teased you like they teased Joseph in his Technicolor dream coat? When did anyone ever call you a dreamer? And when's the last time you had a holy dream? As an Advent people, we are so busy right now, it is hard to create space in our life for daydreams and night dreams with God, right? We are busy merrymaking and cookie baking, and it crowds out any time we have to dream dreams, daydreams that allow us to discern what Jesus Christ is doing in our life right now, daydreams that help us figure out where Jesus might be calling us and our families this week or this month or even into 2019. Are we so busy in Advent that we don't have time to find space for holy dreams where we might be visited by God? And we certainly don't have time for night dreams, right? I mean, we are so busy during the day and so anxious and so exhausted that we go to bed late at night completely exhausted. We wake up early in the morning totally exhausted. Some of us have insomnia, so we're exhausted all night. And so at the end of the day, the shreds of what night dreams we have are often more horrible than holy. I am not Joseph and the Technicolor dream coat. I do not have the ability to interpret dreams. But I know this week, in studying all these birth stories of Christ, all these nativity stories, 
you can't get to the manger without going through the dreamers and their dreams. And that causes us to stop for a second and consider the space we make for dreaming in our life. Because you can't get to the birth of the Christ child, you can't get to the great news that God is with us without moving physically through all the dreamers and their dreams in Matthew and in Luke. And really, the story that God just was born among us as one of us to be with us, that story doesn't get very far, doesn't get any traction, doesn't make it through history without the dreamers on the other side of the manger. Right? The angel had to come to the wise men and say, whoa, 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 don't go back to Herod. Bad stuff. That kid's in trouble. That happened in a dream. You can't even launch the birth narratives into the world without going through the dreamers and their dreams. A life of daydreaming and night dreaming when we can commune with God is essential to our life of faith. And so whether we are wise like Zechariah, or young like Mary, or whether we are somewhere in the middle like Joseph, we are called to be a people that creates space in our life for dreams. Picture God like a parachuter, Dennis. Dennis was great at skydiving. So, um, so we have to create a landing pad for God in our life. We have to create holy spaces in our days and even in our seasons where we can create this space for God to drop in and let us know what God is up to in our life or in our world. The other beauty of these dreams, the daydreams and night dreams we have with God is they allow us to connect the dots. We have to be able to create a space to be dreaming with God so we can connect the dots between what we're doing in our daily life and what God is about in our world. Dreaming helps us connect the dots between our life of faith and kind of our everyday grind. And finally, dreaming is great for doorways in our life. So if you look at the biblical narrative, think about a story with a dreamer, it's often a doorway. So dreams happen and God visits in those dreams when people are moving through a threshold from one season to another. Sometimes they're in a wilderness like Jacob, they feel lost in their own life and a dream comes and it sets their feet on the path like the children we're talking about today. Dreams also come in the Bible to help us navigate our endings and our new beginnings. And sometimes we don't even know we're at a beginning until we get the dream, just like Joseph. So the word in Advent today is obey. We're called to obey God's call in our life. But how do you obey God's call when you don't know what God wants you and your family to be doing? What Joseph got in his dream that day, his obeying God to go ahead and marry Mary, like that, it was a big deal what happened to Joseph that day. He learned something huge about the character of God as well as what God wanted him to do in his life. Think about it. Joseph's a good Jewish guy. He's a rule follower. He knows that the rules tell him he can and, can and probably will divorce Mary because he's a Jewish person. He's following the rules. Then God shows up and says, oh, wait a minute. There's something else about my character that you need to know about. I am also a God of creative mercy. And so I want you to go ahead and marry her and raise that kid as your son, and we'll figure it out as we go. That's a huge change for a good Jewish rule follower. It's a huge change for us. Because in that dream, we learn that God's character isn't just about obeying the rules and following the law, though that is important, but that we also follow a God of audacious, creative mercy, and we just have to go with that God out into the world in love and discover where God is leading us. But Joseph learned all of that because Joseph was a dreamer. Two Josephs, two testaments apart, but they both were dreamers. Don't tell Joseph's cruel brothers, I would love it if people made fun of our church as dreamers. I wish they'd be like, oh, those dreamers at Trinity Presbyterian Church again, right? Illuminated by God's love in their life despite the darkness in this world. Yeah, oh, those dreamers, they're so ignited at Trinity to go out there and share God's love and mercy and peace and creative work with the world. Oh, those dreamers. 
I can't think of a better nickname for the children of God than dreamers. And after all, what is the angel going to tell Mary in her dream in Luke chapter 1? What Mary finds out in her dream is that nothing's impossible for God. So that means we should let the holy dreaming begin. Let us pray. God, we live in a world that doesn't have time for our dreams. A world that is cynical because life is hard and the headlines are crazy. God, may we be a church that is accused of being dreamers. Holy dreamers for you. Illuminated by what you're up to in our life and with our family. People ignited by a passion to share your love with our neighbors and the world. God, teach us all how to dream again. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, our light, that we pray. Amen. Please stand and join us in our final song. Don't forget, you can't make it to Bethlehem this year without doing some holy dreaming. So let the dreaming begin. Go out into this world and have courage. And go in peace. Return no one evil for evil, but strengthen the faint-hearted and support the weak. Care for those who suffer. Love and serve the Lord. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and let all God's people say, Alleluia. Amen.